I want to tell you about uh, my journey in trying to go from visible to invisible. I thought of this title because I said I'm going to stand in front of them. I'm going to feel very nervous. So they're going to <laughs> be exposed to my visible part. But let's see if I can convey something from the invisible that is coming from inside. Now, uh, this journey has taken me to different stations in my life, and I would like to share some of my experiences with you, and I would like to uh, think that some of these may be helpful for you, because they carried me through certain uh, difficult times in my life, and they gave me motivation, they gave me strength to continue. So I've always been fascinated by what is behind things. I always tried to scratch the surface and see what was behind, and I wanted to see how I could connect the visible to the many invisible layers that lie underneath. And as I was growing up, I thought the best thing would be if I became a scientist, because scientists were good at finding uh, answers to questions, and they would formulate, they could even mathematically formulate these answers, so they could even make predictions about things they didn't even know so well if they had the formula. So I thought physics is the best thing for me, I'll go and study physics and I'll find all sorts of answers to my questions that range from non-living things to the living things. And so I studied physics and, um, and tried to learn mathematics to see if I could make these connections between different layers. And uh, quite so for me, it was also not important whether I was looking at non-living things or living things. And in my naivety, I thought if I had those formulas, I would be able to extrapolate from the non-living to the living, and in fact, if I tried a little bit harder later on, during PhD or so, I may even be able to extrapolate to myself, which is a, a complicated homo sapiens. So I thought I was equipping myself very well, and I was preparing myself for my uh, inquiry into this uh, realm of the invisible. And, um, but very soon, after I started studying physics, I realized that things were not that simple. I may not be able to make a connection directly or a transition directly from the lump of iron, for example, that was sitting on the table to the amoeba, which will be in this video you have seen. Um, I may not be able to make that transition so quickly, so easily, so smoothly, unless I introduce biology into my studies. So th at that point in my life, I decided to become a biophysicist. So I will have the physical tools that will allow me to investigate the invisible, the little molecules inside these uh, organisms or the molecules or the atoms in a lump of iron. And also, I will be able to have the biological perspective which shows me the wonderful uh, features of living systems. So I ended up studying biophysics and then I did my PhD, and during my PhD, I started to look at the invisible, the little molecules that you see that help to move these particles in the extending part of this amoeba. So I was studying their structure, and I was studying their structure using x-rays. That is when I was at Germany, and we were doing pioneering work using x-rays on structures of biological molecules. Um, so what is moving there is part of the cytoplasm of the amoeba, and there are molecules that we call biological motors which help to move those components from one part of the cell to the other. So I was looking at the structure of those molecular motors. But in order to study these tiny little molecules, you need very strong x-rays. You're all familiar with x-rays, either you may have had a lung x-ray taken at some point in your life, or you may have broken a, a, a bone and you would have to have an x-ray of that bone. So x-rays are no new thing to anybody. 
But the essays we were using were very intense. We needed very intense, very high intensity x-rays in order to be able to study little molecules like those you find in these systems. So how do we get those very high intensity x-rays? We get those very high intensity x-rays from uh, big machines that we call synchrotrons. So I'm going to tell you about synchrotrons in a minute and how we get X-rays from that, what we, do, what we do with those X-rays, and also I will tell you that taking that path to work at a synchrotron has brought my life into another direction where I also came across this organization that was mentioned, Sesame, which also became a very big passion in my life in the last 10 years or so. So first of all, let's have a look at the x-rays and how they are produced and these intense x-rays. And I wanted to say a few things about that. Not everybody is interested in x-rays like I am. Not everybody is interested in biological molecules. But these, these, uh, the x-rays that we use are generated at machines that are quite interesting and that have very wide areas of application. Now, here you see, if I can manage this thing, um, on the top left, you see a building, a round building. Now, that is a synchrotron radiation source in Paris. That is called Soleil. And on the right-hand side, you see the inside, a schematic diagram of inside of that building. There is a ring, a blue ring, which we call a storage ring, and we have electrons that are running around that storage ring. Those machines are very big. They are, they, that one has a circumference of about, of about 350 meters because the longer the circumference, the longer the diameter, the higher energy you can have for the electrons. So the electrons are the blue lines that you see running around this storage ring at very high energy, close to the speed of light. And when they change their trajectory around that uh, circle, they actually emit light. They emit white light. So this is white light, is light, is radiation that has a wide spectral range. So from that white light, I can select x-rays. Because this is very intense, my x-rays will also be intense, and I can do whatever kind of experiment I want to do with those x-rays. So the yellow line you see coming out of the blue circle represents actually what we call a beam, a beam of white light. Then that white light is collected in this optics hutch where I select the wavelength. Do I want x-rays? Do I want ultraviolet radiation? Or do I want infrared radiation? So I can, using the X, uh, optical system, I can select any kind of radiation I want. And that radiation is then brought to the experimental hutch where I will put my sample, my little molecules, and then I will sit in the control cab cabin and collect my data. So this is the basic setup, experimental setup in a synchrotron radiation source. Now, you may also notice that there are several yellow lines coming out of that blue circle. That means I can put several experimental stations next to each other in that experimental hall. That also means in one uh, part, I can do experiments with x-rays. In another station, I can do experiments with infrared. In another station, I can do experiments with ultraviolet radiation. So the synchrotron environment is a multidisciplinary environment. You can have people coming from different fields sitting next to each other and doing experiments. And these machines are very expensive. So they run 24 hours a day. If you get beam time, what we call beam time on a synchrotron, you apply for that, you get beam time on a synchrotron, you go there and you work 24 hours to get your data. Another point is that because these machines are big, they use a lot of energy, they're very expensive. They're usually built in a consortium of, multi, uh, of several nations. So they are multidisciplinary 
and often they can be multinational. And usually because you have to work 24 hours a day, it's usually young people who go there, PhD students often, who go there and do their experiments. So synchrotrons have a special um, atmosphere or environment of their own. And I used to work there when I was young, in the early days. So let me give you some examples of the kind of experiments you can do with the synchrotron radiation, which cannot be done with normal laboratory sources. Here you see on the left-hand side the pods of a soybean plant. And the plant is grown in an environment where there are metals in the soil. Now we want to know if soybean takes these metals because it's important um, to know if we are going to get the metals if uh, we eat the soybean. So we can put the plant uh, samples from different parts of this plant into the X-ray beam and see what kind of metals are there in different parts of this plant. And you see here the red and the green spots and those represent zinc and cerium metals. So you know that the metal is taken up by the plant and there's a possibility that the metal will be taken up by the plant and you don't want to eat that kind of plant. Now another type of experiment is, has diagnostic applications or implications. On the left hand side you see a liver tissue and there are dark black dark islands on that tissue. Those represent um, or fat islets. And if the liver tissue has a lot of fat droplets, that is a pathological condition which can lead to um, cancer or cirrhosis of the liver. So it's important to detect it as early as possible. But fat is not very easy to detect by other methods. You can detect fat by infrared radiation so you can, if you put your di uh, biopsy sample into an infrared station on a synchrotron, you will be able to see the density of the fat droplets, and that can help for early diagnosis. Now I'm going to move on to a, something completely different in terms of application, archaeology. In archaeology, you want to know the composition, sometimes you want to know the composition of the objects that you find, because you want to be able to say, oh, yes, that vase, we found it in Alexandria, but actually it is, it is using a technology that was developed in Athens in so many years ago. So you want to be able to analyze chemically the contents, work out the technology, and be able to come up with uh, predictions about what that uh, object, wh when that object was made or where. And this you can do non-invasively using synchrotron radiation. So as you see, synchrotron radiation has many applications from archaeology to medicine, from material science to uh, environmental science to energy. It, it creates a special environment where different types of scientists can work together. So I, I come back to this uh, picture because now I want to move on to Sesame, which is a project of building a synchrotron radiation source in the Middle East. Here you see it was already mentioned that the countries who are members of Sesame, they're shown in this uh, brown color, Turkey, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, Palestinian Authority, Iran, and Pakistan. So you have countries that are sitting in a very culturally rich region of the world. They have those countries, the people in those countries come from very different backgrounds, and we all know what kind of tensions exist in that part of the world. The Sesame Project is initiated around 1997, and it aims to build a synchrotron radiation source in the Middle East. The source will be in Jordan. It is, actually not will be, it is already there. It is in Jordan, and it's near Amman. And the major aim of the project is to develop scientific excellence in that region. 
These synchrotron radiation sources, there are more than 60 in the world, but none in the Middle East. So we think that this will be appropriate for the region. This source is also important, or this kind of facility is also important in terms of building the infrastructure around it. If you're going to build a synchrotron, you're going to have to produce wires, produce vacuum chambers, produce power supplies, and this brings um, the uh, this brings expertise to the local uh, uh, economy. Another point is that we also hope that this will help to reverse the brain damage. Uh, brain damage, yes, that's what I'm having. Uh, brain drain in the area. And finally, the invisible part of this project concerns people. People that come from very diverse backgrounds, if they can find a way of communicating with each other, and as I said to you, a synchrotron radiation source actually provides an excellent environment where people work 24 hours a day next to each other. They're usually curious about each other's work. They talk. What do they talk? They talk in language of science. Language of science leaves everything behind. You can talk, you can be curious, you don't feel any um, inhibition about asking different types of questions when you use language of science. So that's the reason why we think this project has a big chance to succeed in this uh, complicated environment. Now, this picture shows the experimental hall of Sesame. So as you see, the ring is there, the shielding wall is there, and we are now building the equipment. And Sesame will become operational in 2015. I'm working as a advisory, I'm working in one of the, as a chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of Sesame. And there are several other committees like the Education Committee. And Sesame has already a staff of more than 40 people. These come from these nations around in the area. And people are working together. Now, are we dreaming? What do we think we can achieve with a project like Sesame? What are we really trying to do? Are we dreaming when we say we can establish scientific excellence in a region where this is not the um, high priority in the agenda of the uh, countries? Are we dreaming when we say science can initiate grassroots change? Are we dreaming when we say, oh, ignore the political difficulties, let's work on this project? Yes, partly we are dreaming because scientists are dreamers. 99% of the time, we get results that do not fit with our predictions, that do not fit what we expect, that we say, oh, my experiment didn't work. But when it works 1% of the time, that gives us the energy to continue, again, another 99% of the time with things not working. That's the reason why I believe we have a good chance with Sesame. You see, the people who are already there as potential users of Sesame, the scientists, you see, we have, every year we have uh, users meetings, the potential users meetings, where people from these countries come together, especially young people, and work together. And those scientists are people who do not believe in limits. They are dreamers, they do not believe in borders. So I believe very strongly that we have a good chance to make this project work and go there and work in harmony. And maybe that is going to add a small drop of positive on the balance of the, um, of the balance on the positive side. I believe in Sesame because I think it is something that I would like to leave, I said this also in the BBC interview, it is something that I feel responsible to leave to the next generations. And you are the next generations. We will prepare it for you. You can take it from there and carry on. Thank you. <laughs>